everyone. Welcome. Welcome to everyone in the room. Uh, welcome to everyone on uh, YouTube. Uh, welcome to the launch of Architecture in Development, Systems and the Emergence of the Global South uh, with the Aggregate Architectural History Collaborative. Uh, my name is Lucia Lais. I'm an associate professor at um, Columbia and the director of the Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture. The project whose launch we're celebrating today, aggregate code name Systems in the South, um, has been a long time coming. It's uh, accumulated and aggregated many esteemed collaborators uh, over the years. Um, it's about what happened when immense varieties of systems thinking uh, found each other in the post-war on the fertile ground of the global south. Uh, I'm not going to take too much of your time. My job is mostly to introduce people and to kind of set the mood. Uh, we have lost one respondent to a minor car accident in Brazil. Paolo, he's okay, but he could not get to where he was going to be to zoom his response. And another respondent or another presenter, Fabiola, to a massive migraine, which is unfolding as we speak in New York City. So. Um, I won't take up too much of your time, but I will set the mood with a little, few more minutes than planned. Um, and which is to say this, uh, there's something self-evident about the subject of this book. Um, we know that modern architecture was a system. The architects announced it as such. And at least among historians, we know that not only modern architecture went south, but indeed that most of its, many of its most systematic aspects were born in the south and only afterwards travel north. And of course, there's, we know there's this kind of self-evidence to the discourse of development with this in incredible ability to lubricate uh, architectural insertions in all manners of places and, and, the, and to grease the wheels of governance and, and building and growth, et cetera. But um, when I read this book, I, I'm reminded that this self-evidence is really an immense challenge to historians. How do we write about something that is systems, because systems have a way of explaining themselves, of accepting any externalities and then incorporating them and said, yes, we can explain this too. Um, systems offer not only systematic solutions, but also clarity and worldviews. And so I brought you one example, and I hope you will recognize the friendliness of this example to this project. Where is it? Here it is. Um, the example is drawn from the work of John Maynard Keynes, who's one of the main theoretical foils of this book. Uh, Keynes, was, of course, was an English uh, economist, a former clerk in the India office, and author of one of the most persuasive economic theories of the 20th century, the general theory of, impl in, uh, of employment, interest, and money. So I'm showing you a very famous quote that Keynes, that is, it's a very famous anecdote that's drawn from his book, where in order to explain the system he recommends, Keynes manages to recommend an opposite system, the system against which he is fighting. So the question is, how, what can you do with paper money, banknotes, when you have a massive amount of unemployment? And the answer is this. If you were to fill up old bottles with banknotes, bury them at a suitable depth in disused coal mines, which are then filled up to the surface with town rubbish, and leave it to private enterprise on well-tried principles of laissez-faire to dig up the notes again, the right to do so, this is the system, the right to do so being obtained, of course, by tendering for leases the note-bearing territory, there need be no more unemployment, and with the help of repercussions, the real income of the community and its capital wealth also would probably become a good deal greater than it actually is. It would indeed, and then he adds, it would indeed be more sensible to build houses and the like, that's the architecture part, but if there are practical and political difficulties in the way of doing this, the above would be better than nothing. <laughs> so just remember, Keynes is trying to recommend to build houses and the like with money. But he says you may as well fill mines with bottles, trash, and cash. So here you have it, systems thinking, a thought experiment which explains why a system is necessary by describing even its opposite as only a special case of itself. So illicit economics is just a special case of the general theory. So as I said, systems thinking has a way of explaining itself as better than nothing, even if they're actually trying to be everything. So how does a historian deal with this? How does a historian write your way around a system and also explicate it and not get incorporated into it? 
the answer is to read this book. Um, and I will say no more about that except to introduce the persons we have thankfully with us on stage to um, introduce it and to respond to it. So, Atia Korakiwala is an assistant professor of architecture here at Columbia. She researches, uh, researches infrastructure, materiality, and aesthetics. Her book in progress is called Famine Landscapes. It's an investigation of the ties between architecture, infrastructure, and hunger in India in the 20th century. Um, Ayala Levine is an associate professor at UCLA. She is the author of Architecture and Development. Subtitle, usefully different, Israeli construction in Sub-Saharan Africa and the settler colonial imagination. Um, and our third uh, editor who was going to be here was Fabiola Lopez Duran, but she is uh, held up by migraine. So as a respondent, however, Debashi Mukherjee is a film and media scholar based in New York and here at Columbia. I like that your bio says you're based in New York, but you're also with us. Her book, Bombay Hustle, Making Movies in a Colonial City, does a deep dive into histories of filmmaking in late colonial India. Um, the other person who was going to join us was Paulo Tavares, who was held up in Brazil. Um, he has been the author of a number of books and is going to be curating the Venice, um, the Brazilian Pavilion at the 2023 Venice Architectural Biennial. So the way this works is that I've asked the editors to present for a little while, then Debashi will do a response, they will do a response to that, and then we'll open it up for questions. So please join me in welcoming long ado um, aggregates and Debashi. <laughs> see familiar and new faces. And especially thank you, Lucia, Jacob, and Jordan for uh, hosting the event and uh, organizing us and uh, organizing us. <laughs> uh, um, and for Debashi for making your comments and also for Paolo uh, that worked on these comments but is not able to share with us. Uh, we look forward to hearing uh, your thoughts. The occasion of book, a book publication is always a happy event. And in this case, uh, case of aggregate books in general, of which ours is the third, the pleasure is magnified by the collaborative energy that went into its production. The project began in 2012 in an SAH, South, in the Society of Architecture Historian panel, and a couple of meetings. So here is one of uh, the first uh, lives of this project. And then again, the project uh, began again with an open call for papers in summer 2017. It involved two transparent peer review workshops in the aggregate fashion. Um, the first hybrid and the second fully in person, in which contributors arrived from different parts of the world. And we're very um, proud of this because people were self-funded and arrived especially for this uh, uh, workshop um, because it mattered to them so much. The call for papers, as you can see here, invited scholars from various fields to consider three overlapping phenomena that reached their heyday from the 50s to the 70s, namely the Bretton Woods currency exchange mechanism, the era of development in the third world, and ascendancy of systems thinking and theory that Lucia presented so well as a multidisciplinary ethos affecting multiple knowledge fields, including architecture and urban planning. So in one thing, we didn't succeed. Uh, our invitation did not yield an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary response. So it's quite uh, common to architects to try to include everybody in our uh, discussion and then realize that um, we are very, um, we're <laughs> we end up talking to ourselves. Um, and, but we received dozens of uh, submissions from architecture historians, many of whom were still in the process of writing their PhD dissertations. Even two of the editors, Atiya and myself, were still PhD students when the project began. This vast response is indicative of the untimeliness of the project, we think, as many PhD students were looking for a body of scholarship to be in conversation with as they developed their research. Unlike in more tailored projects where editors commissioned select authors to represent various aspects of the argument, here the contributors' input determined the overall makeup of the book. So while the first point about the Bretton Woods monetary system receded to the background, but it's, it's still there with all the international institutions that it um, uh, um, uh, enabled, the third, the third point about systems thinking persisted as a substrate in some of the papers 
um, uh, demonstrating exactly the difficulty of what Lucia just said about how to deal with methodologically with that problem. It is, however, the understanding of this period as the era of development that resonated most with the author's respective research interests, even if not all the contributors focus on what we associate nowadays with the Global South. So the era of development also included France, for example, as in the Rindam's paper. The resulting collection is therefore a reflection of the state of the field, and it anticipates many of the book projects that will follow from our many participants. The book considers the role that the design professions assumed in development. Since development was predominantly an economic discourse, the question we try to answer is how architects and urban planners responded to the growing marginalization of their expertise. Unlike James Scott, who associates the design professions with the high modernist theory or of the state, sorry, high modernist authority of the state, or Arturo Escobar, who commented that development was an immense design project, we didn't attribute the design professions any a priori qualities that rendered them particularly useful in the hands of governing institutions and policy makers. It is in fact the other way around. The authors show how the design practitioners fought to assert their relevance and had to refashion their expertise by attaching it to the myriad areas of development intervention, such as health, education, and agriculture, or film, as in Felicity's uh, talk, or how the uh, essay, or how designers try to prove their usefulness vis-a-vis -vis the failings of development, for example, by responding to land speculation or by bypassing bureaucracy. Analyzing the ways in which architects face this challenge of relevance, the collection of essays doesn't represent a comprehensive guide to an architecture of development, but rather some of the practices that attempted to insert, a word that you used, Lucia, architecture in development. I'm now uh, going to uh, present Fabiola's part, which is the first time I'm reading, so uh, <laughs> bear with me. Um, Architecture in Development is overall a collaborative book. In the process of conceiving and writing it, we created a co-learning community, one which requires us to push past our isolated disciplinary and regional silos in the plurality of our voices. Collaborating is never easy, yet it benefits its benefits are crucial ones. An important lesson of this process has been to understand the importance of thinking from the South as an ide ideological and geographically, geographical position. To reveal this fictional nature of a discipline that has systematically privileged Eurocentric canons and paradigms. Collaboration challenges assumptions and reveals architectural interventions and artifacts as part of other networks, processes and systems in which both architecture and self play a critical and global role. The chapter of this book are organized around six themes, development time, developmental time, expertise, technological transfer, bureaucratic organization, designing the rural and land. As will become apparent to our readers beyond these groupings, some of the chapters overlap, interrogating some of the same themes and concerns, but in different regions of the world. The first grouping is titled Developmental Time to emphasize its attention to processes, to the logic of phase projects and their morphologies as a response to the way budgets were allocated. Including essays by Arin Dandata and Islam Musafar, this session analyzes cases in India, France, and Ghana. Um, the second section looks at the fates and predicaments of expertise. It moves from Ayala Levine's examination of UN architects planner Otto Konigsberger's action planning in Singapore, Israel, Sierra Leone, and India, uh, to essays by Nikki Moore and Diana Martinez, who focusing on Mexico and the Philippines, looking at the architecture of training campuses for perhaps the most significant cultural heroes of development discourse, the agronomists. And also in this section, the collaborative of Sebastian Lucent, Viviana Doria, Doria, and Hilde Heinen turn to the, uh, turns to the academic ramifications in Belgium of Habitat, the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements, held in 1976 in Vancouver, Canada. 
The third group of essays pertains to questions of bureaucratic organization. This group includes essays by Felicity Scott, Ginger Nolan, and Albert Lopez, and moves from the proceedings of the Habitat Conference in Vancouver and its audiovisual program analyzed by Scott to the work of Nolan on Christopher Alexander in India and the work of Lopez on Carlos Lazo Barrerio in Mexico. The next section, I think this is yours, <laughs> okay, I just realized. a little bit, <laughs> um, and she's very missed. She's very missed right now, and uh, we're really grateful for this, you know, slide that she made to sort of demonstrate the breadth of this project. So the next section on technological transfer takes the reader to Melanie Sunmin Park's work on the interfaces of labor and technology in South Korea. Yeah. Um, to Manuel Schwarzberg Carrillo's examination of the US housing industry's prioritization of steel in Palm Spring, California. Um, the displacement of Native American communities in that area and the new worker settlements in Ciudad Guyana, Venezuela, an industrial enclave supplying steel to American markets. And finally, to Farhan Karim's essay on the construction of tradition in fostering development uh, in the shape of so-called earth-based technologies and strategies of the self-help, uh, sorry, of um, the strategies of self-help. The section desi titled Designing the Rural has the largest number of contributions. This is not a coincidence. At the turn of the 1950s, the developing world dwelt by a large margin outside of cities and urban settlements. In this section, Olga Tulumi and Petros Fukueras examine the design and construction of villages uh, in the countrysides of countries as different as India and Zambia. Oh, I'm one ahead, sorry. Uh, while Martin Hershenzon and Atiya Karakiwala look at building typologies from cowsheds to silos devised to build up capital accumulation in the countryside of Israel and India. My own contribution to the book <laughs> follows <laughs> Nelson Rockefeller's use of Venezuelan oil camps as laboratories for agricultural production and consumption, creating a comprehensive compen compensatory system and using a seamless aesthetic of a sterilized and rationalized rurality centered on food. The last session of the book addresses an essential element um, of architecture uh, that architectural discourse has addressed little in the last several decades, land. Focusing on Turkey, uh, Greece, and Cyprus, essays by Burak Erdem, Paniota Paila, and Konstantina Kalfa shows how the political economy of land became one of the most fraught problems in development discourse land continues to be exceptionally resistant to its transformation into a purely economic element. This selection of essays reflects the breadth and scope of submissions. Uh, we received which conspicuously lacked scholars working on socialist modes of development from the Soviet bloc and the non-aligned movement. This absence in our book was not by design. Just switch to my bit. Thank you for hosting us. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Devashree, for reading. I look forward to the comments. Uh, I will try and offer some of the insights that emerged from the book. Uh, as always, you know, to begin with some caveats, the book is not comprehensive uh, of development and neither will my comments be, but mainly I offer up some signposts that coincide, um, but not fully, with the structure and division of the book. Um, they don't line up neatly with the sections, and a lot of the themes cut across many of the chapters. Uh, and I hope to underscore some of the contradictions that we address and that emerge in, in, uh, about what development hoped to be and what, what it became. 
uh, paradoxes were produced because development theory wanted to do two opposite things. It wanted to both manage the economy and let the economy unfold. And so from here, we kind of end up with some contradictions. So one, one contradiction, for instance, is that development succeeded as a discourse even as it failed as a theory. So while the economics of development failed both in theory and in practice, uh, and didn't really install the imagined industrial modernity, you know, the ma industrial modernity that it imagined in the global south, the word development still has power and it still continues to be deployed with that power in many different spheres uh, that, you know, we still aim to develop many different parts of the world and call those parts of the world undeveloped and underdeveloped and use various versions of those words. Follow up to this point, to paraphrase uh, Arturo Escobar, development was this immense design project, and uh, Ayala quoted that as well. Um, it was structural, it was structurally all encompassing and totalizing, and yet it had little space for designers. So, this again is a kind of uh, contradiction there, specifically architects. And architects in this schema were subordinate to economists, they were subordinate to bureaucrats and planners. And this put profession, uh, pressure on the profession to redefine its expertise. And so that really goes to that section on expertise. And I think expertise is one of those themes that really cuts across all of the chapters, which is why I'm beginning with that. And uh, bureau bureaucracy kind of is fit in here. So this would be, um, what this insight is, is that um, experts, are, uh, okay, sorry. This, uh, this insight really relates to the fact that experts are all over the place in, this, in these stories in these chapters, but expertise is not so much that of bringing authority and knowledge um, that lead, which in other stories, you know, that have talked about development and expertise have led to all sorts of unintended consequences, but rather architects fashion themselves as experts in translation. They interpret between the world of economics and the world of people. Um, so given that this system embraced every aspect of life, eating, education, work, health, leisure, um, all of these spheres, the architect begins, uh, becomes capable of translating and interpreting between these different aspects. They exhibit a power of care, a power of management. That becomes their uh, way of, manage, uh, of entering into this system. So, even as they have to translate between people working on the economy and the emerging unmodern subject of the modern state, they have to do this work of socializing the people, quote unquote. So this out, the outcome of this is that, one outcome of this is how architects tend towards sound planning, they tend towards regional planning, they tend towards uh, becoming capable of negotiating between these different scales, that from the scale of the person to the scale of the nation state. Um, the next big point is about developmental time, that first section, and this point is about the temporality of development. There is this concern for process over object over project. Instead of projecting an end, an imagined conclusion, architects design processes with no idea of that end in mind. Something new and unknown can possibly emerge when we design process. Process becomes more important than project, but at the same time, architects become capable of fantasizing and prophesizing uh, a different and unknowable future. Uh, and so this again goes to that kind of expertise of translation. Mm. And in that uh, sense, this developmental temporality connects up with the temporality of the nation state, which is that of a constantly deferred future, a constantly delayed promise, the promise that never arrives. Um, on the other hand, this leads, uh, on the question of this horizon of incompletion, on the horizon of this incompletion, we have the question of technology transfer. This is really an attempt to skill the unskilled, the unwitting subject of modernity, who has been left behind. This skilling involves a huge component of self-help, a turn to natural materials, cheap materials, community building, even community building, right? Like, uh, so the subject is to be taught how to both build their own houses and their own communities. And then this section on technological transfer connects up to this um, other section on designing the rural, where if the subject of technological transfer is the poor rural subject, then the architect aims to give them agency in this world that they don't have. And the rural is both, well, first it's imagined as a Rousseauan ideal, um, self-contained, bounded, a community, 
but this is contra but contradictorily, contradictorily, the rural is also imagined as a site of accumulation, the accumulation of capital. Um, and so the rural gets caught between these two poles, the pole of, you know, the fantasy of the ideal community where people are eventually self-sufficient and skilled and uh, independent. And on the other hand, it is caught between, uh, it the rural becomes a key locus of economization, uh, the site of accumulation of capital. And uh, so this condition of the rural and the rural subject is caught between these two opposing poles of fantasy and economy. Um, the last section then is land. And here too, um, because of its juridical and symbolic nature, land resists economization. And because of this, because of how it resists this kind of entry into the developmental sphere in economic terms, it becomes one of the most fraught aspects of development. Um, and so to conclude, what happens is that this, uh, this set of, I really didn't want to say developments, but I couldn't help it. <laughs> These developments set the stage for the emergence of the global south. And that's that title, you know, that, that, that's how that emerges in the title. Because of how the, this part of the world becomes a place of extraction, even as its industrial modernity is stimmied by the structural forces that, to quote uh, the historian Vinay Lal, put the third world in the waiting room of history. Right? So that's. Okay, so first of all, thank you to Lucia for a very creative experimental decision to invite me <laughs> to be a respondent here today. A huge congratulations for this very hefty tome. Um, it's a real delight to be meeting Ayala and to be in conversation with Atia and Ayala, two very musically resonant names, <laughs> bringing more joy on this bleak kind of day. Thank you for everyone for being here. Okay, so um, what I want to do is, as the film scholar in the room, I'm going to use two clips. Um, and they're from a film that some of you might have seen. I'd screened it a few years ago. Um, it's a film from 2017, a documentary film that was made collaboratively by an architect and a filmmaker from India. It's called Nostalgia for the Future, made by Rohan Shivkumar and Abhijit Mukul Kishore. And it's a film broadly on Indian modernity, the production of the citizen subject, and the architecture of the home. So I'm going to show us a little clip uh, from about 30 minutes into the film, in which we will see a glimpse of public housing built in New Delhi in the wake of independence and partition, and the developmental fervor of a technocratic nation. And then I'm going to use that clip to kind of talk to some of the big themes that I took away from the book. Okay. Safed Poshak mein engineer sahab aaye, daadhi banakar, saaf, sutre, safed. Poonima ke chand ki dara safed. Inke haathon humare udhar likha tha. Inka astr, inki buddhimatta. जो अव्यवस्था से व्यवस्था छीन लाती सतह देखकर भीतर की गहराई भांप लेती इनका अस्त्र विज्ञान आधुनिकता की कल्पना नागरिकों के एकजुट होकर एक ही समय काल में अपने इतिहास और भूगोल की भिन्नता मिटाकर सांस से सांस मिलाकर काम करने में है विविधता और समानता की धुंधली रेखाएं पहचानने में है
दिल्ली शहर स्वाधीनता के बाद बहुत तेजी से बढ़ा भारत के विभाजन के बाद जहां करोड़ों शरणार्थियों को आश्रय चाहिए था वहीं देश की राजधानी के विशाल सरकारी तंत्र और उसके अफसरों को निवास रेफ्यूजी कॉलोनीज लेड आउट इन गुड मॉडर्न स्टाइल Actually, it was not very different from civil lines in the British way of doing things, where you just had a road access, you have plots, and then you had accommodation with a little bit of a setback, and you were given a minimal space to live in. When you come to the new imagination, everything is according to a concept of what constitutes modern living. and all these other at that time modern or futuristic advantages of the city like pipe water supply and sewage and electricity motorized transport meshed into this idea of the garden that on the one side and also i think there was a kind of an engineering mindset right so architecture is actually very basic and is not imbued by any of the cultural values overtly although those are implicit in the way things were done whether people were happy with it or not it's very difficult to say but on the whole it was a very happy place it is partly because all those who came to inhabit the new spaces were actually immigrants and for them this was not too much of a disjunct because most of them were employed of the state style of state sponsored documentary film from india that the filmmakers are doing their critical commentary in this particular mode of voice over intonation which is also like the expert commentator telling you uh, what modernity is and so on so there's much to discuss here but i want to pick on that closing line about the happy living managed by a new kind of social figure the middle class indian who was employed by the state lived in public housing and was learning to be a modern citizen these were immigrants and refugees survivors of intense communal violence state engineered famine and mass displacement as we revisit the architectural meanings of modernity with this book is there space to acknowledge these kinds of violence and this is to my mind one of the central questions of this anthology I think one of the reasons why I am on this panel today is because of some urgent conversations that some of us in this room had during the MoMA show the project of independence last year and as Athia had noted in a review that she wrote about the show and I'm quoting that the show was steeped in longing for a return to a more hopeful time when architects made nation states that's the end of the quote and many of us were unsettled by this nostalgia in that show by an accounting of the 1950s 60s 70s as a kind of romantic project of independence rather than a project of active and painful decolonization a project of reckoning with colonial trauma and the trauma of civil war with the paternalism of a state that mistook the aspirations of a society for the aspirations of an economy nostalgia romance yearning for a past were all mixed up in this exhibition with an overriding sense of failure incompletion and crisis which are words that recur in this anthology which seeks to reframe existing discussions on 20th century global modernity through the lens of development editorially this is a political economy approach to the circulation of certain built forms and certain attendant theories of design in the post war bretton woods era there is an argument about an epistemic vision that emerges from a new economic regime based on the infinite exchangeability of the american dollar a vision wherein the world and its component parts be they in the hinterland or in the imperial periphery are infinitely modular to impose this frictionless modular order onto the world we need an army of globe trotting experts consultants and planners not quite the globe trotting bourgeoisie from the communist manifesto but close 
and we have remarkable stories in this book about figures such as Jacqueline Turwitt and very interesting her under-recognized influence on Marshall McLuhan and very interesting discussion of the emergence of the term the global village in that section that Ape was talking about about the rural. So coming back to development, the term itself may be tricky to define, but the editors are more interested in the knowledge practices, the design projects, and the social epistemic actors that were produced under the sign of development. One of the looming actors in the book, apart from all the individuals that are mentioned, is the vastly expanded state with a paradoxically enlarged purview even in an age of liberalism. The essays examine the emergence of new nation states alongside this expanded mandate of the state with its dependence on Bretton Woods institutions for loans and expertise and along with that uh, massive kind of debt concomitant with the institutions such as the IMF and so on. Now the developmentalist mandate was not and could not be in practice frictionless, which is why the word conflict comes up at several places in the book. And it is in the first section of the book that we get some contours of this conflict. So for a book about architecture, this conflict is necessarily mapped onto discussions of space. As Arindam Adatta explains, the 1960s global development system necessitated, and I quote, a veritable army of geographers, sociologists, statisticians, and planners who set to work modeling nations national space in the image of the mathematical field formalisms propounded by economists. And he continues, spaces in other words was another name, space in other words was another name for geographical unevenness. The inevitable imbalances and conflicts emerging from historical divergences of capital formation, technological absorption, cultural habit, political resistance and so on between localities and regions. And that's the end of Datta's quote. Now all the contributors to my mind in varying registers are keen to underline the violence and the conflict baked into this era. And to do this, it is necessary to confront that word and that vision development. And as the editorial introduction notes, to radically disassemble this word development and to move it beyond, again, in, in the words of the editors, move development beyond the innocuousness of terms such as global modernism and colonial modernities that have a risk of erasing the sinews again of conflict encountered in these globalizing and modernizing projects. And that's from page two of the introduction. <laughs> now in this sense, this is a book about development as decolonization and globalization, but properly named development as neo-imperial control. Now, Timothy Mitchell, a colleague of mine, in Rule of Experts, a book from 2002, has argued that the project of economic reform in Egypt was a work of both theory and violence. And this is a view, I think, that the editors and the contributors echo in this anthology. The epistemic violence of certain abstractions and dualisms had material consequences that continue till this day. To quote again from Mitchell, making the market economy required a series of framings which attempted to fix and exclude, such as simple dualities of real versus representation, objects versus ideas, nature versus technoscience, land versus the abstraction of law, the country versus the map. Thus, for example, as Olga Tulumi outlines in their essay, Jacqueline Turwitt's proposal for a model Indian village commissioned by the United Nations bypassed any considerations for religious spaces, perhaps hoping that the sticky problems of caste and religious division would simply disappear. And I'm quoting now from Tulomi's essay. For Turwitt, the principal desire was not to enter into the intricacies of rural society and economy, but rather to fix the position of the village within a network of expertise and distribution of resources. End of quote. But the frictions and the conflicts continue. And in a sense, it all starts to come apart within a decade. And so we return to this idea of failure, which was one of these overriding, unsettling feelings that we got from that MoMA exhibition. 
And the book begins and ends with a discussion of failure. The editors propose the idea of development time, as we've just heard in the introduction, a temporal extension that seeks to manage contingency by prolonging infinitely the promised horizon of arrival. And Atteya Kharakiwala returns to this idea of deferral in her essay, where she discusses the substitution of materials and designs as a technique to sidestep the aporia of development in which structural change remained a perpetually deferred promise. There is a certain messianic horizon to development, and I think all media theorists also continually run up against this horizon and it's very strange, magical kind of theology. When will we get 100% electrification? When will our homes become completely smart? The authors contend that the term failure is not adequate to the task of truly understanding what it is that unsettles us still about development. And the term failure also misnames the condition. And here it's salient that Atiya invokes Ashish Nandi on the success of the idea of development and its continued political power. And by political power, I mean the uh, magical ability it has in terms of political invocation in electoral campaigns that continue across the world and aid in various populist kinds of programs um, across the globe. So I have a question at this point. Um, for Mitchell, Economics needs abstraction and the simplification that abstraction yields in order to exist. Models and then systems are a part of this project of simplification. Mitchell says that economic expertise is forced largely to overlook the forms of leakage, network, energy, violence, and irrationality that he discusses in the book. Because economic expertise cannot take them seriously for that is not its task. And yet this outside, these excesses are vital to capitalism. They are a source of its energies, the condition of its success, the possibility of its power to reproduce. They are a heterogeneity that makes possible the logic of capital and thus ensures both its powers and its failures. And this is the last line in the rule of experts. So my question is, is this a kind of optimism about the social messiness of built form, for example? <laughs> this is that leakage. It's the leakage. It's happening <laughs> right now. So I'm asking, is this something optimistic that's happening right now? Is this roof just going to reveal the sky now? That would be cool. I would expect that from G Star. No, so I just have a question about is this a kind of optimism, this kind of social messiness of build form? And do you share this optimism? Because it seems that the project of mapping resistance is not urgent in this book, right? So why is it that you made that decision? And then I think more from a media studies kind of a perspective. I can talk if people can hear. Okay. <laughs> and, and then the question about what are these other terms that are not systems or models like network assemblages, uh, leakages, can they offer something here? Instead of say straightforwardly resistance, agency and so on. Um, I had one more part if we can just collect another thing, right? So I wanted to also come back to the question of films. Now films played a very big part as you'll see in the book in the Bretton Woods institutions and the post-war developmentalist networks because films do a lot of work to both explicate and extol uh, these ideas to facilitate exchange and translation. Felicity Scott's essay, for example, takes this dimension on quite centrally. And here I'd like to note that there is an increasing focus within film studies as well to think about the role of media forms as systems. And as Lee Grieveson has put it in a recent book, to think of the role of media systems in the emergence and expansion of a global capitalist system 
that has been and continues to be brutally violent, unequal, and destructive. And this is because the traditional focus in film studies has been on fictional, narrative, and artistic genres of filmmaking rather than on pedagogic films. Films that many are now terming useful cinema, a directly utilitarian cinema of the kind that we see enmeshed in these histories of developmentalism. And this enmeshing between this useful cinema and developmentalist projects happen at various dizzying levels. And I was reminded of something from my own life. So for example, I studied, at, I studied filmmaking way back when at the institute um, and at, at a school in Jamia Millia Islamia University in New Delhi, which is called the Mass Communication Research Center. It was set up in 1982 in collaboration with York University Toronto and the Canadian International Development Age Aid Agency. Now the Canadian Development Aid Agency provided my school with a range of equipment and York University sent the first generation of teachers, which was led by distinguished documentary filmmaker James Beveridge, a close associate of documentary pioneer John Grierson, the founder of the National Film Board of Canada. And not just this, the building in which I had my classes and my studio and all of that was designed by celebrated modernist architect Raj Rewal, who designed the Hall of Nations Pavilion at the Pragati Medan, which was recently demolished as a monstrosity of a bygone era. And a lot of that MoMA show was also working with our own kind of nostalgia about, um, about things we lost. So there is more to unpack here, but I want to end with an overwhelming kind of sense that we also get in the book that development fundamentally has a pedagogic imperative. Some countries and some peoples must continually strive towards self-education with a kind of a borrowed syllabus. And what is it that we must learn? And here, if I could just play my last clip, uh, because there's something here that takes us back to that first line in Atiyah's review of the MoMA show, which is about what are architects, what are nation states, and what is longing, and what is it that we learn. So I will just end with this. It's a shorter clip than the first one that we watched. शरीर देश है, देश शहर है, शहर मशीन है। हम सब इस मशीन के कलपुर्जे हैं। Number बताओ बात नंबर जी चलो नंबर बताओ बारह नंबर चलिए आपको क्या नंबर सोलह नंबर चलिए आप कौन नंबर 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 तो मालूम नहीं कौन सा माला इस तरह माला नहीं चौथा नहीं नहीं ऊपर ऊपर है बाबू इस बिल्डिंग में रहते हैं और नंबर नहीं मालूम थोड़ा मत थोड़ा मत भाग नहीं मत देना हमारे साथ 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 Tia, do you want to go first and then Ayala, or? Is there something? No, I think just, just about the concept of content and the things you say about that line from the book, and I know that it's a kind of designer and creator of content to 
various case studies and locations. But you didn't seem that interested in counter movements or that. Are we recorded yet? Oh, okay. Um, broadcast is even okay. Um, I, ha I have a I have a, a short answer of uh, about the optimism of the method. Um, we're we're looking at we're using architecture as method to um, get messy with theory, right? So the problem with um, analysts of uh, the discourse of um, development, and I'm thinking of Escobar, who was very much influenced by Foucault when he thought about development as discourse, is that they, they don't go into materialities. And, um, and uh, the thinking about the, the, the power of discourse, but it's also, as Foucault says, it's, it's um, cracks, or uh, cracks would be for ideology, but um, the the moment where you have um, different flows of power within discourse is something that is missed when you don't think about the materialities of a discourse. So this is why architecture is such a good um, um, vehicle to interrogate that. So in this sense, I'm, we're thinking of architecture just as a lens, as a method to, to, to look into the materialities of discourse or how uh, it... Um, uh, gave uh, form, but also conflicted form, as you're saying. Uh, uh, and form, by form, I mean not just uh, aesthetic form, but form in, in terms of method. Um, and then uh, I had another thought. Uh, excuse me, it's been a long night. Um, uh, discourse, materialities, optimism. Oh, the other thing is that I think that you can do that with a lot of other disciplines. You can do that with medicine, you can do that with education. Architecture is not privileged in this sense. Um, all, all the other disciplines, all, all those disciplines that have materiality in them, that have circulation of materials, of, of laboratories, of doctors, experts, um, uh, the building of uh, hospitals and uh, the building of university campuses, all there, in, all there involve a lot of other disciplines. And this is why systems is so, um, and this is already tapping into your next question, systems is such a useful mechanism for experts, a language that they can talk, where they can sh shift between those heterogeneities, between those different fields of knowledges. And that's why we use system as a, as a problem rather than as a, as a useful analytic tool. So this is a fascinating question and also a really good diagnosis because I think it speaks to, and maybe this is slightly unsatisfying as an answer, but it speaks to how uh, so much of the work in here was, you know, one of the first rounds of processing archival work for so many of the, uh, so many of the uh, scholars working, you know, uh, on their on their dissertations, on their first books, on, um, on on their research, and I think that in a way, the resistance parts of them got edited out you know no yeah no in a sense because it was this uh, uh, because it was like oh that will be in another part of the book that's the unsatisfying part like yeah, yeah no 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 <laughs> their books like uh, it, you know so yeah. each of them go on to write their dissertations and they have these and their books and they have these like large bodies of uh, material and work that come together in those frames but then this book was about sort of distilling that system that th the, the aspect of it that intersected with the kind of developmental drive and trying to kind of understand that in the context of this uh, emerging global, yeah. Well, yeah, no, and you, you know that it's also very useful to hear in the beginning that so much of this was like work in progress being done like through dissertation writing and I can't wait for the books to come out. So and it's also something that I was thinking because I was reading Lee Grieveson's book which is called Cinema and the Wealth of Nations which ends pretty much at the moment of Bretton Woods. So it's 1920s to 40s. But it's also interested in these kind of global, like a globalizing system of capital that seeks to kind of flatten many things. But in, and in that he takes this question very seriously saying that I'm not interested right now in offering these counter narratives of resistance because 
it's about time that we laid out that diagnostic project first, mm -hmm. which is new, I think, in many of our disciplines. It's not a conversation we've been having. Yeah. It wasn't a complaint. It was just an opportunity to hear what... No, but it was fascinating that you picked up on it because it really is something that uh, that that I think as editors we we sort of encountered and somehow because of what the project was it ended up in a different place. Uh, but there are multiple cities with multiple veterans and so on and so forth. Right? I think of that as very. It's very interesting what you when you asked about other terms and your examples were networks, assemblage. I don't can't read my own handwriting. Um, uh, linkages is something. Um, because those, of course, are also have, in a way, had a moment in our discipline as the explanatory device, a previous generation, basically, of explaining these global projects. Or precisely, you can imagine the, the shift from networks to global modernism is much faster. And so I also think of the insistence on systems in this project as being that, a way to avoid the, the all-too-easy uh, equation of materiality with that architectural thing which is networked, that architectural thing which is put together, as opposed to just this argument which is about systems themselves. Um, any answers to the second question which is on pedagogy and it's describing certain histories that I thought very compellingly were argued as having been flattened by certain other terms. And terms that we all use, those of us that do post-colonial studies, colonial modernity, what's Bombay in the 1930s? It's all colonial modernity. So I think some very important and timely kind of um, alerts that the book provides. Yeah, and it's uh, sort of funny because to use that term colonial modernity is actually about asserting that modernity is everywhere, right? That you can't pretend that there is no modernity in, 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 the, in the periphery. And so it's sort of, there's a, there's a kind of cycle, like there's a kind of feedback here, which is that for each of these, we need to kind of nuance them. Um, yeah, where was I going with that thought? <laughs> um, so no, on the pedagogical front, um, and on the kind of paternalistic nation state front, yeah, I think that, you know, in a way that subject to some extent is missing from the book, you know, because it is focusing on the, the, the pedagogy, the, 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 the production of that kind of subjectivity and the ignoring of that subject, which is just, I mean, even in the film, you know, it's always in the background and it's always an image rather than an actual in interaction with that um, person and the subject the, and, and, the, and the sort of focus is always on the engineer or the, 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 the instrument even. Um, yeah, no, and it's nice to sort of see that clip because it's very tongue in cheek about the voice of God, right? Um, and I think we're trying to figure out a way to write about this time without that voice of God. Yeah, I was going to do, uh, kind of, there are some in authors the in the room as well. Uh, so a question that I had maybe uh, to start to open it up, um, and if the authors are here, they can respond. Uh, it has to do with this contemporary impulse in nostalgia or to, I mean, you both spoke about it very well, and then you were cited additionally that this discomfort, we, we're supposed to feel queasy about the 60s and 70s because we're supposed to think that independence that it was a project of positive independence. So that we know the show that this was about. And so I was just going to ask whether those who have worked with other geographies are experiencing that today too. Is there a revisionist, uh, I don't know, exhibitions? And is there a revisionist literature in other, uh, I don't know, I suppose about uh, all the different spots that Fabiola highlighted on her map against which this is also understood? I don't know, if maybe I guess in the case of Israel that's very unique. Um, but in the sort of African geographies that you deal with, Ayala, do you feel like there is also a contemporary project under the name of salvaging, under the name of, you know, against demolition to 
impose a kind of nostalgic view of the, this period? This is actually something I, uh, I teach. Uh, um, because I encountered this colonial nostalgia or post-colonial nostalgia while doing research, and it was very hard to grapple with. Uh, I encountered it from my research assistants who were showing me places, but I also encountered it as I, dep I went into the archival depth and came out of it reading, seeing around me whatever I just read in the archive as if time has stopped in the 60s. So this is something that I myself uh, had to uh, work out w because I, I, was, I was not trained specifically as an historian, like nobody ever told me how to go to an archive, but then I was definitely not trained as an anthropologist. So I didn't know how to um, negotiate uh, th those discrepancies and negotiate the fact that I have electric outage and I now experience development uh, and cannot do work because of that and um, just understanding what it means to live in development time. Um, so, um, so I am still working this thing out. There's also a question of just going to the field. What does that mean in terms of... Uh, um, it's a, ju just an entirely different experience of archive. And I think, Ateya, for you it's a bit different because you are from India. So this negotiation is different. So there is also that kind of qualitative difference. Um, um, so I think, I think that also my project, um, the Israel book, um, faults on these lines of there was a time when there was some multidirectionality. So there is a, some sense of, I don't want to say nostalgia because that will put me in a bad position, but there is a sense of, I want to look at this optimistically. I want to look at it from the perspective of African decolonizing states, but it is a perspective of the governments. It is a perspective of elites and how um, and where things can go bad really fast as you said, within a decade, and even less. Um, oh, I, I, was, I was gonna say that one of the biggest challenges, I think, to the, uh, to the, to the scholarship of this time has been uh, the, 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 the call from scholars not to think of decolonization as a historical moment, but as an ongoing project. I think that that sort of really put some pressure on thinking of that those first those years of uh, decolonization as a kind of historical moment uh, the other thing is I think this book in it, it doesn't attack it directly but it grapples with uh, the persistence of the nation state that should that should have by all accounts been an absolute failure but in fact emerged from this even stronger and then how do you account for that strengthening of uh, of this, uh, in, in the Indian case at least, the nation state really becomes a place of claims making. It becomes the, the, the thing to protest against, which doesn't, uh, which doesn't track in every, you know, kind of uh, state, for, like in every model of that kind of uh, question of resistance. Uh, but it, I, I think that that's still open because, you know, as much as the state, in a sense, is a thing that is done with, we, we are done with it, theoretically, but it's not done with us, exactly. It sort of emerged in its kind of uh, nationalist and jingoist and, uh, you know, religious and weird forms that we're not able to yet fully contend with, with even more force. But it, it's interesting that Fred Cooper also talks about development as, as this thing that allows for claim making, uh, the decolonizing claim making of the state. So it's the state and the world, and then there are the citizens or non citizens against the state. It's like different scales of claim making. Um, okay, so any questions from the audience? And, and uh, now I'm not seeing the authors. Uh, oh, Zainab has. Is there a question? Uh, is there a no, I wasn't planning to speak. We're here to listen to the editors. Um, but I do have maybe one question, and, and um, uh, I guess to, I guess I'll pose it to the two para Fabiolas. Yeah, <laughs> uh, just because I think it came up in in her part of your your introduction. Um, 
which was the 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 geographies that are covered by the book and and whether there's anything about the lens of systems that you know drew from certain areas and not from others and 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 Fabiola pointed to the absence of the um, Soviet um, yeah the Soviet the of the Soviet Union and uh, Eastern Europe, but but we could also point out the surprising absence of Latin America. And, um, uh, so I just, just in terms of the editorial process, do you think this is an absence of, of um, you know, at the time of the call of a body of research that that was identifying those, I mean, obviously Wilker Steinecke, but you know, he had his own book project or and just, just trying to get a sense of how you, how you read that geographic distribution I, yeah, in relationship to the Now, project. like an international organization, you have to answer for your globality. Well, no, 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 it's, it's like, no, it's, it's true. It's like, it, it, you know, of course, there's biographical accidents, right? Like, Lukash is writing his book, not that that's to say that he would have written for us otherwise. But, I, you know, I know for sure that Anna Maria was in the middle of her book project. And, of course, there are biographical accidents. But I think, you know, what you're also asking about is some of the kind of theoretical emergences that on the one hand, try to explain the whole global south, but fail to explain the whole global south. And then those kind of show up as absences within even what we really, really wanted to be a kind of more democratic project in which everybody spoke. You know, we had these meetings where we, we broke up into groups and we talked and we read each other's papers and we, um, and, and, and it was that everyone didn't stay from that you know, like there, there's a different set of papers in the end than that uh, group that had the meetings. And yet, um, and in a sense, that sort of speaks to how some of those papers didn't find themselves as fitting within that kind of larger arc. And so it, it the, the, the sort of bright side of this is that means that there's other books to be written and there's conversations to be had and challenges to the model. And um, yeah, that's that's what I will say. It, it's interesting though, because uh, systems thinking was very strong, both in the Soviet Union and Latin America. Um, so uh, there are like the, there's the question of the aggregate reach <laughs> in terms of the call for papers. Uh, so that's about in the institutions. Uh, yeah. And, um, and um, there is also, um, I think that the Bretton Woods um, prominence in the call for papers may have um, uh, detracted people from uh, associating their work with, the, with this. Although in the call for papers, there is a sentence saying, we welcome uh, <laughs> papers from the Eastern Bloc. I, I took the microphone back. Five expertise. Oh. Mm. No, just that it wasn't in our five expert, you know, in, this, in our set of expertise to be able to address it as a competing economic terrain that had different ways in which it it it, it uh, uh, dovetailed into, say, the Indian experience. Or um, I just want to put a good word also for Paulo Tavares, who said he has written his response and will hand it to you. But I think that was going to be also his uh, ability to sort of compare, basically. So um, I just want to add. Um, I should have begun by congratulating you, um, which I think is an extraordinary achievement and, and de a decade of, of important work and I think a really major volume that I've been using in my teaching this semester. And uh, anyway, so I, sh I should have begun that way. And so it was not a critique, my question, actually, it was just more a lens question and like thinking what that means in terms of um, articulating other, yeah. Strangely, I had exactly the same question, but maybe I could, if I, first of all, congratulations. It's really a huge achievement, and I know how much work it took you. I witnessed it, so, um, but, but I mean, if I don't want to press the same point all over again, but I also had a question about that Fabiola circle, and not just, I mean, I mean I'm hoping that you can also answer in a way that is not just in terms of the contingencies of the aggregate group, but really uh, in terms of how this discourse of development um, forms an other or a world outside of itself, you know, in the, it's inter the resistance thinking may have been um, same in both the Soviet and the, you know, Bretton Woods system, and yet they, they were something else. And a similar thing, it seems to be happening now when, you know, you 
difference of the news and what China is doing in Africa is supposed to be the other to what America is doing, what the United States is doing. And so can you talk about the, the outside of this discourse in a more structural way, perhaps, rather than a biographical and sort yeah. of... And I think just to add to that, I would say because of the map that we saw from Fabiola, one, my way of asking this question would be, given that in the introduction you address the question of first, second, third world, and how that, that system kind of <laughs> was so useful in so many violent ways, can we also discuss global south, right, in that sense of what is south, and not outside, but the south inside the north, which is hinted at definitely in, in the essays, but just to have a more clear kind of discussion of that. Sorry, I have to leave. Uh, <laughs> sorry for a flight through. Uh, but I'll, I'll just give my two cents about uh, the, the theory question of development. Um, to answer Zeynep's uh, point, I, 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 I do think that there were variants of development theory or modernization theory. The, 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 it's interesting how the discourse was, on, on the one hand, everybody assumed that there is development and there is modernization on all sides of the globe of where you're going to look at it, but uh, there were variations within the theory itself, and systems thinking in the Soviet Union was not the same systems thinking as uh, promoted, for example, at MIT, and it actually caused a, a, an interesting crisis of knowledge when uh, um, cybernetics um, uh, um, specialists from the Soviet Union had to um, uh, accommodate to uh, neoliberalism. So there, so there are variations, and our book did not allow for these variations so much to be theorized as such. So that is another next book. Um, and I, I, wish, I wish there was such a next book. I, I really am uh, invested in, in the possibility of even thinking about all the... Um, participants within the Bretton Woods institutions from the Global South as having something else to contribute. Uh, th that there are variations within knowledge production and within those institutions that also are being um, 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 incorporated into the institutional thinking within the US. Uh, and I really would like to hear Ateya's response, but I have to go. <laughs> Thank you so much. There is a storm coming. Yes, apparently. Ayala's flight has been moved up because of the storm. Thank you so much for coming and for joining us. <laughs> Ateya, you're not off the hook to, for, for the answer to this. No, 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 but, I, have a, Ryan I have Hall a question. question so. Yeah, no, but the, yeah, you know, this is to get into the question of the global south. What What yes, is the good, global yeah. south? Why does that have this different, um, territoriality than, you know, the third world and all, all of these questions which, um, which, which are sort of hinted at, you know, the emergence of the global south, right? Like in the systems and in the aggregate code word systems in the south, what is the south versus the global south? And, um, okay, so what's my answer to this? The answer is, uh, I think that what, what happens is that development theory if the, you know the, the 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 way in which economists are theorizing it, and here I'm thinking of people like Gadgil and the, the the you know the economists in India who are working and producing uh, a producing a formulae for how resources will be allocated through the five-year planning systems. They are uh, they are trying to do this sort of have your cake and eat it, or eat your cake and have it too, as Arindam likes to say. <laughs> Uh, which is that uh, you really want the kind of liberal model, you, you want to use liberal economic theory, classic e classical economics, but you would like to also have Keynesian macroeconomics at hand. And so uh, what that ends up doing is that it ends up producing a kind of uh, management of uh, you know, the nation state, which as one of the, to quote the book is, you know, becomes too big for small things, too small for big things. So one more of those kind of contradictions that emerges from here, uh, which is that what what ends up happening is that it, to be able to industrialize, you have to find a kind of hinterland. And so that is the kind of south within the north, or rather north within the south that occurs in that block that, um, that was in Fabiola's slide. Uh, and then this, really creates the conditions for 
because global south, we, we tend to think of it as the global, the, you know, thinking globally about the south of the world, but it's the other way around. It's actually thinking about the south, which is the extractive zone, and then expanding that to think about how it, where all it exists in the globe, because every there, there is the south all over the globe in this kind of um, economic sense. And then that becomes, you know, to kind of bring up the Chinese infrastructure example, uh, uh, given that give, given that development is completely dismantled and you know we are living in a completely neoliberal world um, th th that the the theory of development is dismantled the discourse of it allows for then these new connections to be made um, which then allow capital to flow in into parts of the world that would never before have sort of had that uh, had that kind of real positionality of being, sites of extraction without any even concern of installing an industrial modernity, right? That's gone. There's no question. Nobody is installing industrial modernity anywhere anymore. I mean, I have a semi-answer from the Egyptian archive that there are, and this is not to critique the math that Fabiola in absentia cannot be asked about, but the, the hole is not, of course, over the Soviet bloc itself, but there are locations in which the Soviets are operating. And so in the case of Egypt, the same projects which are proposed for the World Bank are floated to the east and the west. And then the, in, in the case of Egypt, the development projects are picked up by the Soviets. So my sense from one answer there is that it really puts pressure on to what extent the states, the sponsoring states, are believing in institutions or not, because the, the relation of state and institution on the eastern side is different. And the relation of states among themselves is a different mode of federation than this kind of international institution. So that could be one answer, that in fact the, the terrain is the same in many places. There are competing projects and projects that go back and forth, but, uh, just in some places, and actually a little earlier than the 60s and 70s and the 40s. And that what is really changing is the the channels that are opened up by it. Um, anyways, just one answer. Um, Reinhold? Um, yeah, no, first of all, congratulations. I know, I mean, I don't know to whom at this point uh, one must address this. And I too am uh, eagerly, haven't made it through everything, but eagerly reading and, and, uh, and using uh, some, uh, some of this uh, for teaching already. But, um, you know, so Deborah Shri, I mean, there's so much to say about DDA housing and the Pragati Medan and all of that. I mean, this is, that's maybe for after, but uh, I, I, to pick up on the conversation, I'm trying to reframe my thoughts to, to pick this up. Um, first, to Lucia's question, I would suggest, uh, the, what, the earlier question you asked about alternative, uh, I would say oppositional thought and practice rather than merely resistance. Uh, I would suggest Adam Getachew's book, uh, World Making After Empire, you guys probably know, uh, on uh, African anti colonial and anti-capitalist uh, thought and practice, and, uh, and um, Quinn Slobodian's globalist, which even within the emerging world order discovers uh, South-led uh, anti-globalist, uh, anti-Bretton Woods uh, pro-proposals, practices that, that eventually are suppressed. So, so, you know, I mean, because this isn't just a linear story. I mean, that, that's basically what everybody's talking about. Uh, and my question had to do, therefore, with another theory from the South, uh, which is a little cl more closely related, related to that literature, uh, that uses systems thought, world systems theory. This is an interested question because I'm thinking about this myself at this point. Um, uh, this is developed in, in various ways, but, but not entirely by chance uh, by Emmanuel Wallerstein and others in Tanzania, and it's not just any Tanzania, it's Nyerere's Tanzania, which is to say the socialist South. So we're talking about, you know, kind of socialist opposition from within at this point, you know, by the time that this is all happening, uh, it's not just the Europeans coming down, what Lukas writes about, uh, but, but within. Um, and developing programs and thought, and people like Walter Rodney and Dar es Salaam side by side with Origi uh, and, and Wallerstein, developing not just a critique, but a different map. And so the, the map, I, this has its own limitations, I, I think, but, but it maybe it's useful to at least compare. 
which is the, it's a, the sort of famous three zone map uh, of core semi-periphery and periphery. And so countries like China and Brazil would wind up probably at that, this point certainly in the semi-periphery uh, and, um, and many of the Eastern European countries as well. Uh, and then core is usually Europe, you know, North America. Uh, and, and if, if we, you know, and, and, but also there's a different time horizon. Uh, this is, especially in Wallerstein's version, uh, a Brodellian time horizon, which is like long durée, you know, centuries. So the, the temporalities that, that I know some of the essays refer to around development shift. It's not to say that, that revolutions and or de decolonial, anti uh, formal decolonization uh, is just a, you know, ripple on the surface of the sea, but rather uh, that there, there are longer term processes um, also underway, having to do with what you're just talking about, the, the, the um, developments of, and uh, as Rodney put it, underdevelopment uh, of these zones. Um, so I, I just wonder whether this discourse and these, these th which is all, which developed, became, it came into being as a critique of modernization theory and even of dependency theory uh, and all of the development discourse. So it, it's deriving from the same places that Europe started. So what do you think? Any Wallastinian aspects to the memories that you've had in the many years of this project? <laughs> Atia is now standing for the entire group. I know, it's not fair. It's like, who else can we ask? Who else was in these meetings? He was there. <laughs> Where are they? They're out there in the ether somewhere. I'm sure. I'm sure Arindam has an answer to this. I mean, and I also, I just, I want this. I don't know. I really don't want to. <laughs> no, because also, you know, I want. I wanted to now move to be a conversation later on at play. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, if feels are there any other questions, burning, burning or not burning, occasional, uh, methodological or content-based, more. Curious, relate this to, and Brodell writes about this as well, the kind of uh, irreconcilability between a kind of systematic approach and a historical approach was in your work working on this, like how did you find a way of writing historically about something like a system which in a way resists the diachronic dimension and insists on like a synchronic, like momentary cut almost. Uh, and how did they too kind of like the people taking on these systems, reconcile the fact that they were trying to bring about some kind of historical and temporal change about, you know, I'm just kind of curious about the whole developmental time question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <coughs> I can also speak to that. So I think my answer would be a little bit as to how, um, and, and to just stay with the Indian case a little bit, because it's the one I'm most familiar with, uh, how economists are placing where the, where, the, where the kind of economy, the Indian economy is in the Rostovian scale. And so it's sort of, if we can get out of this historical mode, or rather a stuckness and create a kind of uh, new set of conditions, if we can create the conditions for takeoff, Right, it's creating a kind of set, of, and then it will unfold on its own. So, you, so, so I think that is. Uh, I, I think historically we treated. We, we're looking at archives, right? So we're saying this. It, so, it, it, in terms of how, and I mean, again, not to speak for everybody. Everybody brought different historical approaches to this material. It is a very deeply archival book. So that's, I think, key to remember. So, uh, um, you know, in my own work, I, I um, have certain kinds of, like how do I treat this this question? I can answer that if not for, because it's also kind of, it, 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 there's a lot of people in here and they're all in the middle of their own projects. But uh, in my work at least, it <laughs> the question became how does someone like Gadgil who's interested in the question of uh, crisis and war and, re and using those as points to retool an economy, uh, how is he reading Keynes? So how is he, so, so I mean, it becomes, I, I, it, to me, it's not, it, I'm not, it, 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 of course it is possible to historicize systemic thinking. How is it, I, 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 that just proves that I'm in the history camp. 
that's all it does, right? Right, right, like, I, because I'm not, I, I can't think, I'm not a system thinker. I'm not a person who will ever think that this kind of system is uh, overarching and persistent. And, but it is sort of, I, I mean, to your question of how, I, I think it is this sort of economic abstraction of imagining that you can install certain mm -hmm. um, possible conditions that then this process can unfold, and that's the lack of historicity, right? Like every this process will unfold the same way every time. It's, it's, yeah. So to transition to the part where people can privately ask you about this, thank you, um, thank you both immensely for first of all, congratulations on the book. It's incredible. Um, it's a real treat to read. Uh, it's very rigorous. It's deeply archival and still brings up all those sort of questions that Debashri, non, notwithstanding her non-disciplinarily, <laughs> amazingly diagnosed as being part of basically daily life, like a diagnosis of daily life that is permeated by these systems. So thank you also for the absolutely on point. I think w from now on, all responses to architectural things should bring films. <laughs> Just to remind us of how the engineer is seen in white and, you know. <laughs> um, and thank you all to the audience as well. Uh, congratulations again.